take your copy of God's Word and turn to uh, where I'm going to start anyway. This is a, a, going to be a topical sermon, and I'll confess to you right now, I don't typically like topical sermons, but uh, as we reflect on the past year and as we look forward to a new year, it's not a sermon that you have not heard already, but you have probably long forgotten it. Uh, I preached it when I first came here, as a matter of fact, so the interest of full disclosure um, it is what it is. But I'm going to start in 2 Timothy chapter 3. I'm just going to read the final two verses of the chapter as we consider these very vital matters that we must never forget as a church if we are to be faithful to our God in heaven. Paul's writing to a young pastor, young, I say young, he's probably in his 30s when he writes these words. Uh, That is, Timothy is probably in his 30s when he writes these words. But here's what he tells him. 2 Timothy 3, verses 16 and 17. All scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. Amen. This is the word of the living God. And true God. Let's ask for his help as we usually do and we should do as we consider the preaching of it this afternoon. Let's pray. Again, our Father, we come to this, the primary means of grace that you have ordained your church to place in the very heart of the life of the church. We pray that it would be the heartbeat that moves us as your people, that we would love your word, meditate on it day and night. And we would hear your word and do what it says. We pray that because it's your word, that your spirit would teach us. He penned it. May we hear from him, hear from our Lord even, as the word goes forth this afternoon for the good of your church and to the glory of your name, we ask and pray these things for Christ's sake. Amen. I think it's safe to say that one of the reasons uh, professional athletes are so good at what they do is because they practice. The fact is, of course, if you want to be good at anything in life, you must practice it. I suspect if you asked our pianist uh, how many hours a week she spends practicing, I suspect it might even shock you, though maybe not surprise you. Professional athletes spend hours every week perfecting their craft, perfecting the things that they are doing that they might not falter under the weight of competition. One of the things that they practice and continually remind themselves of are the very basics of their sport, how to swing a golf club or a baseball bat or how to, uh, how to hit a tennis ball. They do this time and time again so that that when the pressure of the the match or the the event is on, they won't falter and fall apart. They spend this time relying on or working on that they might then rely on the very basics that their craft teaches them. These things that must be solidly in place in life, if we are to, if you are to withstand the onslaught of the various pressures that come. Now, the Christian life is no different than an, as a professional athlete or a piano player. We, too, as God's people, regardless of where you are on the spectrum of maturity, must practice the basics. You must lay hold of them. You must use them And you must perfect them every year that you live. To not do that, to ignore them, is to do so to your own peril. And God has not left us without knowledge or understanding of what these things are. We call them the means of grace, the simple means of grace. God gives them to us that he might sustain us as we live and move in the world. Thus, when the onslaught of life hammers away at us, at you, from every corner, every circumstance, whatever it may be, you can rely on them. You can lean upon those basics, those means of grace that God has given to the church to help them through the the difficulty of pilgriming in a fallen world. 
Now, I wonder this afternoon, even as I've already admitted to you that you've heard this before, of course, because of the way I preach, that is to say I preach extemporaneously. I only have an outline up here. The sermon may come off differently. It may be worded differently as we go, but chances are good you don't remember much of what I said almost one year ago, but we should remember. And the question is simply this, do you, God's people, do you understand that if you fail to exercise the means of grace that God has given to us in the church, these things that are given to you, that they will result in a failure to use them, will result in lethargy and, and ultimately, potentially, apostasy from the very faith that you profess to love and believe. So simply put, in some sense, it's kind of weird, but in some sense, this is like a, a, a large shepherding visit, except you're all here, not in your living room. How's your Bible reading? Many of you have heard me ask that question when I come and see you. What are you reading? And are you benefiting? Are you prospering uh, from the word written as you read it, as you meditate upon it? What does your prayer life look like? Both personal and corporate children, do you pray? What's your faithfulness in worship look like? Are you here week after week unless providentially hindered? Now I know what you're going to say. I know what you're thinking. Now wait a minute, I'm here. You're preaching to the choir. Well, that's true, but there is also a live feed going out and only the Lord knows who's watching this from their home when they probably should be in worship. How is your faithfulness to the corporate gathering of the saints? God gave that to us, not because he wants to give us something to do, but he knows that we need each other. We need not only the scriptures read and proclaimed, we not only need prayer, we need worship, we need that time in which we come together apart from the world and our normal activities, that we might profit from the presence of God, that we might grow to full manhood and maturity. I suspect we all need to answer that question. I jokingly said last week, I'll say it again, I, I kind of joke, I'm not sure if it's a joke, it may be a joke, only God can answer that question really, but sometimes I'm convinced that God made me a minister to make sure I go to church. No, I didn't get that, that's not original with me, that was actually Alistair Begg, but anyway, it's still humorous and I'm still not sure if it's a joke. Sometimes I wonder. You can ask my wife uh, the number of Sundays that I get up in the morning or I've been up half the night and she gets up and I say, I'm, not, I'm calling in sick. Well, obviously, that's ridiculous. I'm going, right? Okay. But, you know, it's not the pastor, the only one in the church that ought to take seriously worship. God's people should too because it is the means, it's one of the means that God grows his people to maturity. How are you and you listen even in worship to the sermon? As it were, a meal prepared for you. Do you prepare for it and then meditate on it after? I can't tell you how many times I've heard from people, I don't, I'm not growing as a Christian. And then I ask them these diagnostic type questions. Are you spending time in the word? Are you praying? Are you exercising the means of grace? Are you taking advantage of the sermons that are preached? Are you doing these things? Well, no. One has to wonder why they're not growing. Children, if you stopped eating, you'd stop growing. That's just the way it is. That's why your mom and dad put food in front of you and then threaten you if you don't eat your meal, make you sit there all night. And I've done that. Not to my kids, but it was me. So we must hear, again, a sermon that has been preached. We must hear these things as we enter 2022 as a church, as a body of believers. You know, as your pastor, I am committed to the ordinary means of grace and nothing else. And I don't apologize for that. These things that are vital to our existence as a church and as a people. And so I'm going to show you this afternoon three primary and foundational items given to you by God by which, with careful and diligent use, you will be strong and successful in your lives as Christians. I'm going to show you uh, through a, a myriad of passages, uh, many I'll turn to, many I will not turn to, 
But I'm going to show you these three primary and foundational items given to you by God by which, with careful and diligent use, they're not magic, you have to use them, you will be a strong and successful Christian in a, in a world that's not your home. First, we're going to consider the need to commit to Scripture primarily, foundationally. Then we'll consider the issue of prayer, committing to it. And then the issue of committing to corporate worship, where we see then the third primary means of grace, and that is, of course, the sacraments. Let's first consider this issue of Scripture. Each of you, I'm convinced, as I've got to know you over the last year, it's hard to believe I've been here a year and a month or so, Maybe you're thinking it seems like five years. Okay, be that as it may. You know that one of the things that I've said from this pulpit, I trust time and time again, is the the authority of the Word of God, without which we have nothing to say and nothing to offer a hurting and dying world. And I trust and have come to believe, for most of you anyway, as I've visited with you, you have the same zeal for the Scriptures. But there was a time... In Israel's past, when this wasn't the case, the prophet Amos, that shepherd prophet, made reference to this in Amos 8.11, that there was going to be a famine in the land, not famine for food or water, drink, but a famine of the very word of God itself. And I suspect in the church, and the word, never mind the world, and the world rejects the word, but the church itself, it seems, as I look across and I witness and I watch through various mediums of social media, the news, the articles that I read throughout the months and years, that the word of God just doesn't seem to be as important as it ought to be. There's a famine. And I hear it from people when I talk to them and they tell me they're not growing in the church that they're attending because why? And I ask them these diagnostic questions, not to proselytize them to come here, but to find out they're not growing because the church that they are attending isn't committed to the unadulterated, unapologetic, plain preaching of it. Everything else is important, not the scriptures. But our confession of faith makes it abundantly clear how central and necessary the word of God is to the life of the church and to the life of the believer. We read of that in the very first paragraph of the opening chapter of the confession. A confession that was rooted in Scripture. We read there, although the light of nature and the works of creation and providence do so far manifest the goodness, wisdom, and power of God as to leave men unexcusable, that is to say they walk out their front door and they see the sun and that's it, they're without excuse. General revelation. But those things, they're not sufficient to give the knowledge of God and of his will. I can't tell what God's will is for me by looking at the stars. These things which are necessary unto salvation, therefore it pleased the Lord at sundry times or at different times and in different manner to reveal himself and declare that his will unto his church. And afterwards, for the better preserving and propagating of the truth and for the more sure establishment and comfort of the church against the corruption of the flesh, the malice of Satan and of the world, to commit the same wholly unto writing, which makes the Holy Scripture to be most necessary, those former ways of God's revealing his will unto his people being now ceased. Jesus himself said that man does not live by bread alone. He said that to Satan when he was tempted to turn those rocks, those stones, to bread. Now, if the Lord of glory says to Satan, man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God, if that's the Savior's own uh, advice, exhortation, his own statement, how much more should it be ours? He who was impeccable and could not sin. We're not that. We need the word of God as a light to our path that gives us guidance and direction in our lives. To ignore the scriptures is the same as to turn off the lights in your house and walk around in the darkness, and then you wonder why you get a stubbed toe. Well, turn on the light switch. Maybe you can see better. Children, do you read your Bible? Those of you who can read. 
Even if you spend just a few minutes a day reading something, mom and dad, you should be giving them things to read. How else are they going to learn to love the Scriptures if you don't teach them to love the Scriptures? And the Bible itself is not silent as to the reasons why we should value and treasure the Word of God as it is, as it is given to us. There are a number of ways, a number of areas that I'm highlighting here to give us reason to lay hold of the Word of God in the new year with a reckless abandon, to place it in the center of our day and the beginning and end of our day and at our meals and in our worship service, in our Sunday schools, in our trail life and American Heritage Girls programs. Without it, we have no hope. First, it's infallible. You show me a book that's like the Bible. There is none. They don't exist. There is no error at all in God's Word. It can't fail. And as a result, it's a safe and accurate guide for all of mankind. You wonder why the world's in the mess it's in? I'll tell you why the world's in its mess it's in. The answer is right in front of them if they would just pick it up and start reading, but they refuse to do that because of the hardness of their heart, and the world's gone nuts because they reject the very word of the living God. It's worse when Christians do it. Oh, undoubtedly, the world's going to question the infallibility of Scripture. They're going to reject the truth of it, too, because their minds are darkened. Second, it's not only infallible, it's complete. We don't need to add to it. We don't need to come up with a new revelation of God. He's given us everything we need to know to live this life. There's much more to learn, but we have all we need. God does not need to speak to us today audibly. You want to hear God speak? Open your Bible and read it out loud. When I was pastoring my previous call, when I first got there, actually, it was actually the first Wednesday night, and that means I was there for four days or five days. I sat in a prayer meeting, and I listened to a woman give testimony to the fact that she heard God talk to her and speak to her in audible ways. I'm sitting behind her, thankfully, in God's providence, And the teacher, who was an elder in the church, didn't even bother to correct her. If God can speak, what do we need the written word for? He doesn't speak like before. The same woman said that she wished there was a burning bush out behind the church, that she could go talk to God. I thought to myself, oh man, you've got so much better than that. Just pick up your Bible and read it. We don't need a burning bush, and it wouldn't be better if we had one. We have the complete mind of God in the Scriptures. Third, it's infallible, it's complete, it's authoritative. No book in the world speaks the way the Bible speaks. The Word of God is living, it's active, it's sharper than any two-edged sword. It's able to discern the motives and intentions of the heart in a way that no other written literature is able to do. It's that way because the Word of God is fixed in heaven, and David says that in Psalm 119, 89. Forever, O Lord, your Word is firmly fixed in the heavens. It's sufficient. 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, the text I led the sermon off with. All Scripture is breathed out by God. Some translations, it's inspired by God. Breathed out is a better translation, but be that as it may, it's breathed out by God. It's profitable. We all know what profit means. You get to the end of the week and you've got more money, in your, uh, more money left over in your paycheck than you spent. You have money left over, that's a profit. If you have less, which is the case of most Americans, you're not making a profit. The Bible is profitable for us. It's given to us for various means, uh, four different ones, in fact, in which every time you read your Bible, one of those four things that Timothy is instructed in is happening when you read the Scriptures. I wasn't going to do this, but now I am. I'm going to go back there for a minute. What are those things? Profitable for teaching. 
for reproof, for correction and instruction in righteousness. What does that mean, Paul? It means every time we open our Bibles, every time you hear the Word of God preached, every time it's occurring, one of those four things is happening. Either you're being instructed, you're being taught, trained, you're being reproved, you're corrected. In fact, I'll tell you plainly, when I work on sermons, this verse comes to mind, and I have a separate section in my notes. If you want to see my notes, you can. Some of you have seen them. But I ask myself these questions. Does this text reprove? Does it correct? Does it instruct? Does it teach? What is it doing? And how might I preach it that way that it might help God's people? But it's complete. It's all that we need that the man of God may be thoroughly furnished to perform the works that God has prepared for them. Fifth, it's efficacious. It does something. If I didn't believe that the Word of God preached did anything, I would have never gone into the ministry. It's already discouraging sometimes as it is. But this is the one place I guess I feel most comfortable because I know when the Word of God goes forth faithfully that God is working. He said so himself. The God who cannot lie has said that his word does not return to him void. It always accomplishes the very purpose of which he sends it. It could be for blessing. It could be for conviction of sin. It could be for cursing. It's going to be for something. It always does something. When I was a boy listening to sermons, and I listened to a lot of sermons, and I thought I was being made to, and I didn't think I was listening. I must have been listening somewhat. It does something. When you read it, it does something. It's not just an exercise of Christian living so that if Pastor Bill shows up at your door, you can say, yes, I read my Bible. I have no idea what I read, but I, but I read it. No, it does something. It has effect upon the minds and hearts of men. And so what are the means? What can we do in the new year? Maybe you're doing them now, and so you're being reminded or encouraged to continue well, our brother read from Joshua chapter 1. Here's Joshua taking the reins from Moses, the servant of the Lord, the greatest figure in the Bible outside of Christ. Undoubtedly, he's a little nervous. Wouldn't you be? And he's pastoring a pretty large congregation of about a million people, give or take. <laughs> yeah, I'd be a little nervous too. I get nervous just pastoring 65 of you. What does God tell him to do? Some self-help program, 12 steps to being a faithful leader, an effective leader in the church. Yep, that's what he told them. No, do, yeah, go to this seminar and you'll learn how. He didn't tell them that either. He said, meditate on my word. Keep it in front of you all the time. Think on it. Ruminate over it. Meditating on scripture is like enjoying good food at a fine restaurant. Nobody rushes through that. Well, maybe you do, but... Most people don't. Rush through a fine meal, a prime rib. I hope you all had lunch. Prime rib and, and medium rare, of course. Vegetables that are just steaming. I just, the, the whole atmosphere is glorious. You're not in a hurry, I don't think. Meditating on scriptures is a lot like that. We ruminate over it. We don't rush over it. We meditate on Scripture. We are thinking through and allowing the Spirit of God to communicate to our own hearts, showing us the commands, the precepts that will turn our affections to Him. We're looking at it like a fine jewel from different points of view as the light strikes it differently. Second, not only should we meditate on Scripture, that's something you can do all day, by the way. You don't need to have a Bible open in front of you. That's why you should memorize Scripture. I'm coming to that. Simply reading and studying the scriptures. Be an approved workman, rightly handling the word of God. The Bereans who, in Acts 17, heard sermons and examined them from the lens of the scriptures to see if what was being said were true and what sermons were they listening to. Not mine. Sermons from the apostles of all men. They took that pretty seriously. Do you read the scriptures? 
There's a gazillion reading plans out there. Ask me, I can give you a, a, pl- a list so long it'll take you a year to read them all. Use one. Not just to merely check the box, but familiarize yourself with Scripture. Read through it, cover to cover. It's a suggestion, of course. I can't make you do that. And balance of the church, history of the church wasn't doing that. Before there were Bibles, like we have them. But read it for knowledge's sake. Study it. Pick a text. Dad's purpose this year to take your family through a book of the Bible. Use Matthew Henry's commentary, if necessary, to, to, to amplify the things that are said. It's a devotional commentary. It's beautiful. It's wonderfully written. Whatever the case may be, read and study it. Meditate it. Meditate on it. Read and study it. Memorize it. Psalm 119.11, a verse that is often used in proof texts for memorizing Scripture. Thy word I have hidden in my heart that I might not sin against thee. Not just in the mind he's talking about there. He said the heart. But as R.C. Sproul so aptly quips, or quipped, he's been with the Lord now four years. It's hard to believe. For him, it was just a couple seconds ago. I think I'm jealous. But anyway, the mind is the feeding trough of the soul. If it's not in your head, you can't feed on it. Memorize Scripture. And, you know, and, and it's, you're not too old to do that. You're not. Children, you should be able to memorize large, large segments of God's Word. Don't waste these years. Take advantage of it. You older in the room, you can do it too. It can be done. There are many different techniques and ways, and I can give you any number of them if you ask me. But commit to doing this. Do something to put the Word of God in your mind and then in your heart that you might be able to meditate on it when you're at work as you have occasion to think about it, or you're driving down the road listening to who knows what, or standing in the shower. There's all kinds of opportunity. Commit to Scripture. Without it, we have no hope in the world. We are doomed with no light to our path. Commit to prayer. Personal prayer. It's a quote I've used from Matthew Henry more than once. But when it's right, it's just right. He says about prayer, he says, You may as soon find a living man that does not breathe as a living Christian that does not pray. Do you understand his point? If you say you're a Christian, you're praying. If you're not praying, you're not a Christian. You can't say I'm a person and not breathe because then by definition you're dead. This is something that we all should be doing in our own lives, at home and wherever. Personal prayer, it should be our joyful duty. Paul says that as much in Philippians chapter 4. To be anxious for nothing but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let our requests be made known to God. In 1 Timothy 2.1, we read there that we are to pray for kings and all who are in high positions that we might lead a peaceful and quiet life. In Ephesians 6, Paul mentions that this is an issue of the armor and the armor of God. Why pray? Why should we pray? Doesn't God know what I need before I ask? Well, of course he does. The same God who knows what you need before you ask is also commanded that you pray. And they work together, and don't ask me how, because I'm not him. We pray because we are needy, independent creatures. Aren't we? Consider this room for just a moment. We've been in this room now for about 59 minutes, give or take. And every one of you have been breathing the oxygen that's been provided and never thought about it, unless you're unusual. We need it. We can't live without God say so. Can't breathe on our own unless God provides the oxygen needful to do so. Our hearts that are beating in our chest, again, that you've given almost no thought to today, probably, maybe a couple of you have, but you're not doing anything about your heart. You're not telling it to beat. It just beats. 
at God's sovereign pleasure, how hard would it be for him to stop it? Pretty sure he created the universe by the word of his power. He can stop my heart anytime he wants. We're needy people. We pray that in the Lord's Prayer. Give us this day our daily bread. Why? Because we're acknowledging to God that we're needy. And one of the ways we express this need and prove that we are dependent upon him alone for life is that we pray. We pray privately. We pray corporately. We do so because we know that God hears us. He's not so busy that he can't handle a billion prayers at the same time. Let that sit in your head for a few minutes. I can't hardly talk to three people at once, let alone hearing 30 people at once or 30,000 people at once. But when God hears you pray, it's as though you're the only one speaking to him. And he's told us as much in 1 Peter 5 to cast our cares on him. Why? Because it's therapeutic, after all. No, it's because God cares for his children. He wants to bear the burden that his children have, to cast, to unload those things on him is the idea that Peter has here. Now, what are some specifics of prayer? The Bible is clear that prayer was a central emphasis across the spectrum of the canon. But just some examples. You have the example of the Apostle Paul. Almost every one of his letters begins with some report of how he is praying for the church. They were just words. We have the example of posture in prayer. From kneeling to standing to raised hands to sitting Not one is more holy than the other, though I would suggest that we don't spend enough time on our knees. It's a humbling thing. Have you ever prayed that way? It's not normal for a westernized person to do that. But our posture should be one of arguing with God for those things that are agreeable to his will. We pray his promises. We argue with him as a lawyer before a just judge. You have promised to help me. You have promised to provide for my needs. You have promised to be with me. You have promised to persevere me to the very end of my life. Those aren't wishes. I don't say to God when I'm praying, well, if if it pleases you to to keep me in your kingdom until the end, then, uh, then so be it. But if not, okay. No, he's promised that. I don't need to worry about whether that's his will. It is his will. But I pray that regardless. Give me what you promise. Grant to me what you've commanded me. Help me as you have promised to help me. The psalmist repeatedly, I know that some in the church call the psalms the inspired songbook, and in some sense it is, but it's really a prayer book as well. How many times does David cry out to God in discouragement and despair and misery and and, in strife and under persecution and attack? What does he do? He turns to the God of heaven. Who else can you turn to that alone can solve those things? Prayer displays an attitude of humble reliance upon God. Those who don't pray and say they're Christians, contrary to what Matthew Henry said, I'll leave some room, are telling God they don't need him. I got this. No problem. Let him who thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. Sometimes God teaches his children's lessons and they fall flat on their fat face because they won't pray. Simple means of grace. James tells us that the fervent prayer of a righteous man accomplishes great things. In James 5.16, And he gives examples of that there. One of these months, we'll get to James 5. Prayer. Might I suggest to you a book? I don't do this very often from the pulpit, but every once in a while it's not not inappropriate. But Thomas Brooks, the great Puritan, wrote the book called The Secret Key to Heaven. You can get the abridged edition edited for more modern English. Or you can read the original one. It's harder, but... Puritan paperback series, Banner of Truth. No, they didn't pay me to say that either. 
the secret key to heaven. It's all about prayer. And in the typical Puritan way, they don't leave any stone untouched. Private prayer, congregational prayer meetings. One of the things I was asked when I came here, when I was candidating, actually, is how I feel about corporate prayer meetings. I said, what, are you kidding? Yes, I'm in favor of them. Church that doesn't pray together dies together. You've heard me say that before. It has to be one of the saddest things that I have witnessed in the church in the last, I don't know how many years. The priority of congregational prayer meetings, are just, it's just not there. Churches cancel them. Why? Because no one shows up. And then we cry about the culture and we whine about the circumstances of our world and our nation and the leaders that we have, and yet we're not praying as the people of God together should be praying. The Lord's Prayer, by the way, is a corporate prayer. It's not a, it's not a private prayer. It can be a private prayer, but it's a corporate prayer. Our Father who art in heaven. But too many have other things to do. Instead of placing it as a priority in their week and teaching their children of the necessity of prayer, both private and corporate. You know, I get the typical excuses. I've heard them. It's not relevant. I can pray alone. Well, of course you can, but it is relevant because we have the example of the apostles all the way through the Acts of how they gathered to pray together. Some of you are very faithful in this. Some of you could probably improve. While we pray on Sunday and worship, isn't that enough? Well, let me ask you a question. Do you really think you pray too much? Raise your hand if you think you pray too much. Don't, because I'll write your name down and you'll be the first person I visit in 2022. <laughs> and learn the secret of praying too much. None of us pray too much. Well, most people don't attend anyhow, so why should I come? That's right, add to the problem. Come. As a church, we, we must do that. I recognize that there's probably legitimate exceptions, and I'm not trying to soften this at all, but, you know, I am sensitive to certain circumstances, and I get that. But in general, the church, this church, I'm not preaching to other churches, could improve. Other churches could too. And I suspect if the church of the Lord Jesus Christ took this matter seriously enough, took it seriously, well, wow, I just can't even, I have no idea what would happen because I've never seen it happen. There's a story about prayer meetings and I can't remember it, can't, it just left me. It happened in New York City, but be that as it may, commit to it. There's many biblical proofs and support for congregational prayer. If you need some, here they are. Acts 1, 13 and 14. Acts 4, 31. Acts 12, 1 to 5 and verse 12. Those are just three. Church history has taught us that revival was often started through the prayer meeting. We pray for revival, but then we don't do the things that God has told us to do to See that the Spirit of God, true revival, not the one we advertise for six weeks and put on a sign and say we're having. No, real Spirit-led revival has often come, at least in the lesson of church history, through prayer, corporate prayer. We have one. Why not come? Ask yourself, what is preventing it, really? Third, and I could go on a lot longer there, but I will spare you, I'll spare you. Commit to corporate worship in which we hear the primary means of grace, that's the preached word, and then we also take advantage of the sacraments of the Lord Jesus Christ. First, prepare for it. Confession of faith, chapter 21, is all about worship and the Lord's day. Prepare to come. I suspect if you were going to go out for an anniversary meal, you would make reservations, you would make sure everything's ironed and clothes pressed and 
babysitter called, the money set aside that she might get paid or he might get paid. That's just to go out to dinner. You're coming to a meal. More to the point, you're called into the very presence of God. And while it is certainly true that all of life should be lived in worship to God, God uniquely and specially meets with his people on the Lord's Day in gathered worship. That's why he tells us to do it. To neglect to prepare for it is to treat him as ordinary and common. Now I see why I had to write that letter this week. I forgot about that point. The lack of this Christian duty is really a lack of the proper attitude towards the Lord's Day. When we don't treasure the Lord's Day, when we don't value it as God has told us to, as a day that's set apart as holy, working backwards, why would we prepare for it? It's common. It's like Saturday, part two. The bottom line is the reason we don't is because we have too much worldliness in our own hearts and it's revealed in our attitude and commitment to worship the Lord's Day in general and in particular. Worship that is not only prepared for, but is active. A couple weeks, I'm going to introduce something into our liturgy. I think it's consistent with our Reformed tradition in which there's more responses from the congregation as we move through the worship service. Why? Because I don't want you sitting there like a bump on a log being entertained. And by the way, this is not a stage. This is a platform. There's a reason why I'm particular about that, because I'm not entertaining you up here. It's not my job. I wasn't called to do that. You might chuckle every now and then, but that's not my mission. Worship is to be participatory. You're to be active, involved mentally and emotionally and with your whole heart, soul, mind, and strength. For instance, and I've asked you to do this more than once, but I'm just suggesting it, saying amen after you hear the prayers or the singing of praises, simply saying, I agree with what I just heard. May God do it. May it be so. Joyfully giving to the work of the ministry, responding to the word preached, and applying it, third. Our larger catechism is so pastorally helpful here. Larger catechism, question 160, what is required of those that hear the word preached, which is the ordinary and the primary means of grace? You show me a church that's not preaching the word, and I'll show you a church that's not a church. Oh, but they get up and talk about it for a few minutes. That's not what I said. Preach it. With authority, declaratively, the living voice of Christ speaking into the hearts and minds of his people insofar as the minister is faithful to the word. Why did God give this to us? Why did he tell us to do this? What should we do when we hear it? Well, forget it, no. It is required of those that hear the word priest that they attend upon it with diligence, preparation, and prayer. I already covered those things. Examine what they hear by the scriptures. Receive the truth with faith, love, meekness, and readiness of mind as the word of God. Meditate and confer of it. That means have conversations about it. Families, on the way home, what did you hear in that sermon? What did you learn? Hide it in your hearts. Bring forth fruit of it in your lives. Faithful preparation and participation in the sacraments. We have the Lord's Supper here every week. The danger, of course, and it's not a danger, it's not a fault of the sacrament, it's a fault of us fallen people, is that we get very overly familiar with it. We lose sight of the value of it. In the pastoral letter I wrote, which is my habit at the end of every year, I mentioned reading through the larger catechism on the sacraments. They're very pastoral, they're very instructive. And they communicate the Reformed view of the Lord's Supper, which is to say the scriptural view of the Lord's Supper. You want to benefit from this table? Know what those things say in that catechism. Teach your children these things. This is what's happening. God didn't give the sacraments to us that we might just have something to do. He gave it to us that we would be strengthened in the Christian life and mature. So the Word of God, of course, is central to everything we do. Prayer is an outworking and flows out of the preached word and the reading of it. 
In worship is where we enjoy the very presence of God as he blesses us with his presence, as we hear from him, and as we enjoy the means of grace he's given to us that we might then leave this place because we can't live in here and go out into the world and withstand the stress of life. The basics, the things we'll run to every single time the enemy of our souls seeks to ruin us. I've shown you these things again. I've shown you these things. Why? Because we all, including me, need to be reminded of them from time to time. When we look across the spectrum of westernized Christianity, we see a church that is flat out anemic because it has neglected these things. And it's placed, instead of them, it's placed puppet shows and skits and all kinds of weirdness in the worship of God. And then they wonder why the church is so anemic in the world. Because they look just like the world. Churches have abandoned the evening worship service. Now, we are providentially hindered from that. I can assure you, well, insofar as the elders agreeing, if we had our own building, we'd have two worship services on the Lord's Day. Why? Because I need more to do during the week? No. But you need the Word of God more, especially its preaching. We rightly grieve over the state of our culture, its godless and actions, godless actions and morals. But friends, if we are not seeking first the kingdom of God in these areas, the problem is not the world, the problem is us. They're supposed to do that. They're godless people, hard-hearted, blind, and deaf to the truth. You have had your eyes opened. And you can see plainly. To neglect these means is to do so to your own peril. We cannot blame the world for acting like the world, but we ought to blame God's people for acting like the world. And so we need these things. And we need to be reminded of them. Our catechism reminds us of them very plainly. It's why we don't do all this other stuff that other churches do at different seasons of the year. First, I don't see any warrant for them in the Bible. Second, the ordinary means of grace are the things that God has ordained for the church to strengthen her, and that's all she needs. We're just not content with that. We need more. Like a drug, we need more and more fantastical things. Would my sermon be any more powerful to you if fireworks went off behind me? Or smoke rose up from the floor? You might be moved in your emotion, but then you're going to need more of that to the point where you wouldn't even be able to see me because there's so much smoke. Okay, that was kind of tongue-in-cheek, but I think you get the point. What does our catechism tell us? What are the outward and ordinary means whereby Christ communicates to us the benefits of redemption? What are the ordinary means whereby Christ himself communicates, gives to you, his children, the benefits of redemption? These are the benefits that you alone possess as Christians. Well, the answer is pretty simple because I've already harped on it quite a bit. You are outward and ordinary means whereby Christ communicates to us the benefits of redemption are his ordinances, especially the word sacraments and prayer. All which, all three, are made effectual to the elect for salvation. That is to say, for justification, adoption, sanctification, glorification. To persevere to the end is God's work of His Spirit, but He's given you the means of grace that you might persevere to the end. To fail to use them is to fail and to fall. You must take hold of them, must use them. May this church be a model of it. May it be different than other churches. I'm not competing. These are simple things. It's hard to do sometimes. And so we all need to be reminded that God in his kindness has given us his word. He's given us prayer. He's given us worship in which we enjoy the sacraments that we might grow up to full manhood, that we might see the Lord who bought us. Amen. Our Father, again, we thank you for your reminder. It comes across the spectrum of your entire word.
to ignore your word is to do so to our peril. To stop praying is to boastfully, proudly state that we have no need of you. To fail to be in worship unless providentially hindered is to drift to apostasy. God, help us. Help us as a church, this church, these people. May you bless them, help them, and strengthen them all their days. In these things, may they be masters of their craft. We pray for Christ's sake. Amen.